Continuing education credits for physicians and other healthcare professionals is provided by VCU Healthcare Continuing Education. Check out cribsiders.vcuhealth.org for more information. The Cribsiders podcast is for entertainment, education, and informational purposes only. The views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of the host. Welcome back to the Cribsiders. I'm Justin Burt tonight, joined by two wonderful producers from the incredible Peds Crit ICU podcast. Alice, Zach, welcome. Say hi, guys. Thank you for having us. Yeah, We're hey, Justin. To be here. Yeah. This is a great collaboration. Our guest tonight, Dr. Karen Fahman, is here to discuss pediatric ECMO, a great talk whether you're a fellow resident or primary care physician like me. But before we go into it, Alice, can, could you tell us about the Cribsider Show? Yes. We are the pediatric medicine podcast. And Pete's Crit, the pediatric ICU podcast. We are interviewing leading experts in the field to bring clinical pearls, practice changing knowledge, and answer lingering questions about the core topics in pediatric medicine. Today, we have a fantastic conversation with our guest, Dr. Karen Feldman, who's an associate professor of pediatrics at the University of Chicago and dual boarded in pediatric ICU and palliative care where she's an attending physician at Comer Children's. There, she serves as a pediatric ECMO medical director and the pediatric critical care fellowship program director. She teaches us exactly what you need to know about ECMO when you show up to your first pediatric IC rotation. Everything from the basic physiology to where the blood flows and most importantly, how to sound smart on rounds when you're talking about the sweep. It's really a great talk for everyone, even though you'll listen and hear me completely ruin her wonderful train analogy. Let's get to it. Without further ado, here we go. Let's crash into this conversation. Ah, I didn't have more crash. Dr. Karen Fahman, welcome to the Trip Setters. We are so excited to have this talk on ECMO. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much. I'm excited to be here. Uh, this is great because this is a combination podcast where we're looking at Pete's Crit, Curbsiders coming together to talk about an ICU topic. But before we get into this great content, Karen, can we go by your first name? Is that all right? We're an informal group. Sure. Beautiful. All right. We're already friends. Great. Off to a great start. I want to learn more about you. Our listeners want to learn more about you. Can you give us a little bit of an introduction? Give us a one-liner about yourself and maybe something that you're interested in outside of medicine? Sure. Um, I'm a mom of two kids. I'm a wife. I'm a pediatric intensivist. I'm a pediatric palliative care physician. I'm an ECMO enthusiast, which is lucky because of the episode we're doing now. And I'm a Wolverine. And I don't know if there are some non-Wolverines listening, but uh, I'm currently a Maroon, but I'm a Wolverine for life. We only take Michigan fans on our show, so not a problem. <laughs> I think that's going to... We won't offend anyone. Yeah, we're safe. <laughs> um, so... My pick you fellowship right now. Have lots and lots of free time. Do you have a favorite book that you love to to share with any physician? In your free time, that's I right. Would, uh, yes, yeah, so, very much so. <laughs> in your working time, I would say that you actually should probably be reading the Elso Red book. But uh, in your off time, there's a lot of really good ones. I mean, I was like a huge medical nonfiction lover as a kid, even like a young kid. So I read Robert Marion's Intern Blues and. Perry classes, a not entirely benign procedure, all of those books like in middle school. That's I know that's really dorky. You were um, ready. Yeah, I knew. But I'm also kind of a medical history buff. More recently, I got a great book uh, from my husband called No Man's Land, which is about the first women-run hospital in in England during World War One when women were really not allowed to practice medicine. And so they had sort of just started graduating women from medical schools there. And some people would let them take care of some patients, but usually only lady patients and things were different back then. But it's a really fascinating deep dive into those few years that they were running several hospitals uh, during World War I. Oh, wow. That is interesting. Yeah. All right. Our next question is, what is your favorite failure and what did you learn from it? Oh, that's a good one. Um, so I had one time as an intern on the cardiology service where I got a call from the emergency department that they were admitting a three or four year old who was a former TGA, uh, transposition of the great arteries patient who had been repaired as an infant. And they were admitting him for acute respiratory distress. And they said, um, chest x-ray showed a little bit of pulmonary edema. They thought he was in heart failure. So they admitted him to the cardiology service, of course. And I was really tired. It was like 
early in the morning and I'd probably admitted a bunch of patients and I was feeling a little lazy. And back then, I'm dating myself a little bit, but back then when you wanted to look at a chest x-ray, you had to go downstairs to the x-ray oh. reading room and you had to find the big, like, what's the word for it? Like the big reel that you pressed a button and it would like, oh, wow. and it would squeak around the turnstile. And then you would finally get to your x-ray whenever you got to your x-ray. So I didn't go down to look at it because it was late and I did not have it in me to go look at this x-ray mm -hmm. in the middle of the night. When I examined the kid, he looked pretty good. He was sort of chatty and tired, but when, you know, was talking to me, it didn't seem to be in any distress. I may have written for a dose of Lasix. And then right before rounds, I got it together to go downstairs to the x-ray reading room and I do the thing with the x-ray <laughs> files and I come upon his x-ray and I look at it and I'm like, gosh, I really don't see any pulmonary edema. But then I follow the x-ray down just a little further. And there is an exactly quarter size density sitting right no. at the gastroesophageal junction. Oh and I gosh. went, huh. So I went upstairs and I went into his room and I said, patient's name, did you eat money? And he goes, yeah. <laughs> oh my <laughs> That's gosh. Awesome. And I cool. said, oh. And I think really the lesson is like, A, trust but verify. Um, mm -hmm. But B, uh, you know, even uncommon patients get common ailments, right? Like you can't assume that just because he's a TGA that mm -hmm. this is related to his heart. And, you know, probably you shouldn't have been admitted to the pediatrics uh, cardiology service. You should have probably gone mm -hmm. to the OR for... GI or something. Yeah, but wow. Anyway. Yeah, the, the lace, it's won't, he's not going to pee that out. <laughs> no. <laughs> Turns yeah. out, no, probably not. So great. A good life lesson. Trust but yeah. verify. Yeah. And what a great snapshot into how things maybe used to be going <laughs> yeah. down to radiology for your. Yeah, we got a back way then, way back. It may have just yeah. been where I trained, but I mean, this was only, this is like 2004, 2005. It's not that long ago. <laughs> <laughs> Very fun. So Karen, you're program director and much of what you do is mentorship, fellows, residents coming through. What do you think makes a great mentor? And then do you have a particular experience with a prior mentor in your career that you wanted to share? Yeah. So I think there's a lot of things that go into being a good mentor. I help our fellows to pick their clinical mentors and their mm -hmm. research mentors sometimes. I think it's really meeting someone where they're at and helping them sort of figure out how to sort of strengthen the things that they're already kind of geared towards being good at. I've had lots of really good mentors in my career. And I think for the purposes of this podcast, it's probably, it would be remiss of me to not mention Bob Bartlett. He was sort of credited as the one of the inventors or at least early developers of ECMO. He was my mentor. He was the mentor for many other people in the ECMO world. We refer to ourselves as ECMOlogists, which <laughs> is, uh, I don't know if other people use that word, word popularly. But even before I had an interest in ECMO, Dr. Bartlett actually also was kind of a mentor for a lot of us for many other parts of the medical school sort of curriculum. He was also my mentor in probably the most important part of my med school career, which was the med school smoker, which is the med school parody that's based on a musical or a movie mm. and is a full length, like orchestrated feature musical every year. And it's like a huge deal. It's probably got a bigger budget than any play I was in in my theater major co wow. college days. And he was sort of the inventor of the modern smoker. He turned it into a musical back in his day as a med student uh, at my institution where I trained. So that was my first introduction to him. And as a prior theater major, immediately thought he was pretty cool. And then he also, you know, started the Victor Vaughn Medical History Association at the school. And so another thing that I thought was interesting. So I think as far as mentors go, he's really a great role model because he's such a renaissance man. And he's got so much breadth and depth to his knowledge and his personality. And I think is such a great role model for so many of us who sort of missed the the throwback to sort of old school uh, medicine yeah. and the way that it was taught some of the good parts, not the bad parts. <laughs> I love that. I think the combination of the humanities and I have always said, and you can ask anyone, ECMO and musicals just go together. And so <laughs> I, uh, I think he really is validating for that. So this is wonderful, uh, a great mentor. And I think this is a great opportunity where we like to try to virtually mentor and, and share expert knowledge, such as the information that you'll be providing us. And so I'm excited to dive into some content. But before we do that, let's hear from one of the sponsors that helps support the show. This episode is brought to you by HelloFresh. 
With HelloFresh, you get farm fresh, pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep so you don't have to go to the grocery store and interact with people after a long day in the hospital. It's America's number one meal kit for tired doctors, advanced practitioners, nurses, pharmacists, medical students, and listeners just like you. And you don't just save time, Sam. You also save money, too. And that's money that can go to the bid-ticket items on your shopping list like student loans. In fact, HelloFresh is much cheaper than grocery shopping and cheaper than takeout. You can put those extra coin back in your purse. Well, thank you about that. I'm always interested in skipping stuff. So you can also skip the snowy schlep to the grocery store and stock up on snacks, sides, desserts, and more at HelloFresh Market. Simply add these staples and sweets to your weekly order, and they'll arrive at your doorstep along with your meals. Ah, both meals and snacks, Sam. <laughs> That's right. And at HelloFresh, you can get delicious food for any dietary preference or restriction. Just last month, my family and I were able to get quick, tasty, easy vegetarian meals delivered directly to our doorstep. So to get 65% off, that's more than half, go to HelloFresh.com slash Cribsiders65 and use code Cribsiders65 to get 65% off plus shipping. That's HelloFresh.com slash Cribsiders65. Alice, maybe do you want to start with our first Peds Crit ICU unit case from Cashlet Children's Hospital? I would love to. So here at Cashlet Children's, uh, we've got a four-year-old male admitted to the PICU intubated with severe ARDS secondary to pneumonia. Despite high ventilator pressures and several adjunctive strategies for his ARDS, he develops worsening refractory hypoxemic respiratory status. The team is concerned that he requires ECMO support. So yeah, maybe before, you know, jumping into all the details of how we're running this, uh, Karen, can you walk us through what exactly is ECMO and, you know, what are we trying to accomplish? What's the goal of ECMO? When, you know, why are we even considering ECMO? Sure. So ECMO is an acronym for extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. With ECMO, you're really trying to accomplish support of a patient who either has severe enough respiratory failure that they can't be supported on a ventilator without causing severe lung damage or a patient who has hemodynamic or cardiac failure who can't be well supported on vasoactive agents, or both. The ECMO circuit's sort of draining the patient's blood, exchanging oxygen and carbon dioxide, and then pumping the blood back into either the right side, the venous side of the system, or the left side, the arterial side of the circulation. But really, the main goal of ECMO is to deliver oxygen to organs. That's really like the tenet of ECMO is oxygen delivery. So um, maybe it's a good time to talk about oxygen delivery. I don't know if I you guys so. have talked about this before. Okay. So Let's sort of start with the equation. I know math is not everyone's favorite to hear about on a podcast, but this will, I, I promise I'll try to make it painless as much as possible. So the equation for oxygen delivery is the cardiac output, which is your stroke volume times your heart rate, right? And then multiplied by the oxygen content of the blood. And the oxygen content is going to be your hemoglobin times the saturation times 1.34, some say 1.36. There are people that have very strong opinions about this. I do not, but I generally go with 1.34 plus the PO2 times 0 0.003. Sometimes that last part, that PO2 times 0 0.003, because that's such a tiny number, is just left out and people just mm -hmm. say, don't worry about that part because that's like, that's hardly any oxygen, right? In ECMO, that can actually be an important number, but for most purposes, the bulk of the oxygen content of the blood is happening because of hemoglobin oxygen saturation and that 1.34 number. So I'm going to break it down a little bit better so that it's not just an equation that you have to remember for boards. And I'm going to use a metaphor. And I do have to credit another mentor of mine who is my first chief out of fellowship, Rasha Durgam. And thanks to Rasha Durgam, every Cribsider listener is going to know about the trains and potato metaphor. However, mm. I'm going to like flesh it out a little bit and really get into the weeds. And I'm going to take that metaphor a little further. Wants. Yes, yes. Yes, a little further. I'm going to try and make it even a little more nuanced than he even did. So I want you to imagine that the body and its organs are connected by a train system. Okay, so it's like one big train system. We'll call it the Oxygen Express. The heart is the engine or the station. The organs are the villages and the villagers. The track is the blood vessels. The train cars are your red blood cells. The cargo, which is potatoes in this situation, are oxygen-bound hemoglobin. So, I mean, and all of the villagers, they live on, on potatoes. So that's their diet. So the speed the train is going is your heart rate. So that's how fast it's getting around the track. And the number of train cars in each train length is your stroke volume. Okay. 
And all of those cars have to be filled up with potatoes to bring to the villages to deliver their cargo. And you send the train cars out loaded with their potatoes. And at each village, the potatoes are unloaded so that the villagers can eat them and consume them and use them for fuel. And each village gets its appropriate share. And now the train comes back around with whatever surplus is in it. Now, the surplus is really important. And this is probably the most important number in the PICU, in my mind. I may be more biased because I'm an ecmologist, right? But the surplus is the SVO2 here. So we're going to talk about that a little bit more. But the surplus has to be a certain amount in order to be able to adequately provide supplies to the villagers. Because like maybe some of the potatoes are bad. Maybe they just don't want to like dive all the way into the train car to get them. But ideally, you are delivering actually four to five times the amount of potatoes that the villagers will actually eat. And so when you get back to the station, the cargo should still have about 75 or 80 percent, three quarters or four fifths of the original cargo in it. It sounds wasteful, right? And in this time, and you know, when food prices are going up, like whatever. Mm, but yes, but let's just say that you get back for adequate fuel, you really want to see that return cargo be 75 or 80 percent. So under normal circumstances, that's going to be the case. And this number is really important in determining how sick your ICU patient is. And it's also really important in determining the ECMO needs of a patient. So if a patient, for example, has too few train cars, meaning they have decreased stroke volume, let's say they don't have adequate contractility to their heart, they have to make more trips around the track to make up for that. And that's why you get tachycardic when you have decreased contractility, right? When you have a patient who shows up with myocarditis, they are tachycardic to beat the band, right? These patients come in and I hound the residents and the fellows with Liebermeister rule. Do you guys know that one? Unfamiliar. No. So Liebermeister is the amount of change in heart rate you should see for every degree above normal in fever. Oh, yeah. Hmm. Right. Oh, I the love name. this. I'm about to quote this at every rapid Tell me. Here you go. It's been told to me that someone else calls it the Fahmenmeister, but I don't think that's probably totally accurate. I would like to we'll take credit. We'll start using it. We'll start using sure. it. Yeah. So Liebermeister says for adults, I believe the number for adults is that for every degree above 98.6 Fahrenheit, you get an increase, I think, of six in your heart rate or six or nine in your heart rate. For every degree Celsius, it's nine. That's what it is. Unfortunately, nobody cares about kids as much as we do. And so no one actually technically extrapolated that for children. So I personally decided that for a pediatric patient, that's about 10% for every degree Fahrenheit, right? Because six, an adult, normal adult heart rate's like 60s. 10%. So yeah. sure. And 15% for every degree Celsius above 37. So anything beyond that, is an inappropriate increase in heart rate based on a, a fever. I mean, you have other reasons to increase your heart yeah. rate. You could be on albuterol. You could be uh, all sorts of reasons. A lot of, of good reasons. reasons, when, of reasons. Sure. But if you have a patient who comes in with a fever and is real tachycardic and is making you nervous and you're not sure if they're septic, if you have a kid who is febrile to 38.2, but their heart rate's 190, like mm -hmm. something ain't right. So that violates Liebermeister. There's also Faget sign, which is the infections that actually specifically violate Liebermeister. So those are yellow fever and salmonella typhi. Interesting. So tidbits of like info. So you can use those on rounds too. Oh, you can say which, I, which infections will not cause an appropriate rise in heart rate. This is amazing. I, as far as on the current trail without the detours of the yellow fever yes. and uh, typhi, <laughs> which we, we, should, we, we can absolutely talk about. It sounds okay. like the... ACMO is replacing the the harvesting lungs. The the farmer who's the lungs is bringing the potatoes onto the, the train. And ECMO is the lung dialysis that's replacing the farmer of putting the potatoes on the train. How close is that to the metaphor? Am I, am I totally sort off? Sort of. Yeah. I mean, I think of it as a separate train system or an additional train system, an augmented train system. I mean, okay. if you if you have that patient who, despite you loading up extra train cars and speeding up the train with epi and norepi and everything... If you still don't get adequate surplus, if your SVO2 or your surplus potatoes are still not at least like three to one, if you're not at least sort of 60% when you get back, or some would say 50%. And if they then start having to look to other sources of fuel, then you are starting to think about, do I need to think about ECMO? So these are patients on lots of vasoactive agents who are not able to achieve the adequate oxygen delivery. So in this case, 
I would suggest that you might think about them as having an alternate source of fuel. And for the purposes of this, I'm going to expand the metaphor and say that those villagers are going to start using cassava root, another random thing. The only reason I pick cassava root is because cassava root, without being processed and cooked thoroughly and then pounded, is actually toxic and causes cyanide poisoning, which causes lactic acidosis. I admit, I may have lost the metaphor. So the cassava <laughs> root... Is the ECMO replacement no, oh, not is the potato yet. alternative? Okay. We're not all there right, yet. Right. Because Saber Root is building your lactate. I see, I see. It's when you're in anaerobic. You don't have enough potatoes. You're you're going to the anaerobic respiration, the cassava root. Yes. You're you're going uh, beautiful. I'm with you now. Sorry. Yeah, so so you don't have enough potatoes, or at least you're not, you're not getting enough potatoes, and you are your SpO2 is dropping, and now you've gone to look for another source of fuel. You're eating cassava root. Now your lactate's rising. So now you have an SpO2 that's like 50 to 60, and you have a lactate that's going up, 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 and you're on all these pressers. That's a patient who is in trouble, right? And if you don't do something about that, if you don't have any other out, ECMO is kind of the right out there. So that's a patient that needs VA ECMO. They need cardiac hemodynamic support. And that patient then can, you can give them extra train trips. You can give them extra train cars and you can fill it up with potatoes because you're oxygenating the blood for them. And then you get that back around. So understanding just kind of how oxygen delivery works should really help you understand the physiology of ECMO. That's just hemodynamic support. That's a, that's a VA ECMO patient. So that patient has lactic acidosis. Maybe they have septic shock, but they're not too vasodilated to be able to support on ECMO. That could be a problem sometimes. So that patient needs VA ECMO. And then, you know, you can start thinking about patients who are in respiratory failure as a second type of ECMO, and that's VV ECMO generally. So for most intents and purposes, the two main types of ECMO are VA and VV. If you get fancy, there's VAV and VVA and OxyRVAD and all sorts of other stuff. But most of the time, if you can understand the general tenets of VA and VV, you're going to do fine. As a PICU resident, as a PICU fellow, probably need to start thinking about those other things past that. But for the most part, that those are the main tenets. So if I were just going to think about this, ECMO is able to increase your, your oxygen delivery because one, it can increase your cardiac output through flow, and then it can increase oxygen content because it can actually put oxygen into the blood. It helps both sides of the equation, I guess you could say. Yeah. And if you think about that other sort of metaphor where a patient or a train system has, instead of having not enough train cars, but instead just doesn't have enough potatoes they're starting out with a low oxygen saturation, then their SVO2 is also going to be inadequate coming back to the other side. They're going to have too little surplus because they started out with too little. Mm -hmm. And those are patients in respiratory failure. They can't get oxygen into their bloodstream. So those people are going to need VV ECMO. Those are the ones where the ECMO is getting the new potatoes, the VV ECMO desaturating. The VV is, that's the bread and butter for my potatoes. Or that was the the ECMO I was more familiar with. I'm on board the train now. I'm sorry, Zach, you had a question. Yeah, yeah, well, it's just a, 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 maybe a simplifying comment. Something that I didn't understand early in residency is that you have to deliver an excessive amount of oxygen compared to what's consumed. You have to deliver you know, in health three or at least three, maybe four or five times the normal amount of oxygen that's consumed. That wasn't clear to me until you know, deep into my residency. And then the other thing is recognizing that increasing your heart rate, tachycardia, increasing your stroke volume is an early sign that something's bad going on. So like a, an early, a normal response to hypoxemia or inadequate oxygen delivery is tachycardia, increasing the heart rate, trying to make up for that reduced oxygen delivery. And or anemia has the same response. I would get tachycardic anytime a patient was sick. So that's how I knew they were doing rough. When I got tachycardic, <laughs> it, it was bad news bears. But your lactate didn't go up because you were able to increase your output and and keep up with your extraction. More potatoes. I didn't need the cassava root. It's all potatoes. Cassava. 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 Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So here we've got this four-year-old with ARDS. I'm really wondering what in an isolated ARDS patient is going to tip you over to calling the ECMO team? And then as we start to get the circuit set up, what are the important things for the people at the bedside to know about it? Sure. Um, so a patient who is in respiratory failure, I, I think about Largely in pediatrics, at least, we have uh, a calculation called the oxygenation index or the OI. 
that's the thing that we've kind of used historically to determine the severity of respiratory failure in an infant or a ch small child. It kind of starts to lose a little bit of its wind when you start talking about large adults with like big, thick chest walls, because then you can't actually really tell what the alveoli are seeing in terms of mean airway pressure. But the oxygenation index is a calculation. I think of it as the work that you're doing over the result you're getting. So it's the mean airway pressure times the oxygen percentage you're delivering, FiO2, divided by the PO2. And as that number edges closer to mid-30s to 40, despite optimal ventilator management, which is a little bit subjective, and in littler kids, that generally means that we've often tried the oscillator first. As that inches towards 30s and 40s, and 40 is kind of the classic cutoff based on some studies back enough years ago that we probably should redo them, that number is where people really kind of pull the trigger on putting a patient on VV ECMO. In a four-year-old, you might be a little challenged to find a cannula that is easy to use for VV. You might be able to. So that patient might end up going on VA ECMO just because of lack of vascular access. Mm. And so just so I can to confirm and, and uh, kind of as a teach back, we're talking VV ECMO for kids on respiratory distress, so whether it's severe RSV or, or COVID, and we've tried optimal ventilation, lung compliance is too stiff or mechanical ventilation is failing, we're seeing the OI hit a critical level, and that's when we're thinking VV ECMO, lung dialysis, uh, oxygenation, uh, putting potatoes on the train. Is that is that about right? Yeah. The only problem with the lung dialysis uh, metaphor here is that, or analogy, actually, that's an analogy. Uh, the lung dialysis analogy here is that um, you think of dialysis as removing something from the the body or, sure. or filtering something. And in fact, when you put a patient on VV ECMO, you usually have to add volume to the system in order to be able to support them. And so you end up needing to dialyze them. Reverse dialysis. <laughs> yeah. Got yeah. it. Reverse yeah. dialysis, which is a bad metaphor yeah. because you do need additional actual kidney dialysis. Great. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm on board. Yeah. So you're worried about this kid. You call up the ECMOs technician. You say, hey, we got to put together a circuit. And you see all the tubes and the wires everywhere. What's going on over there? What is actually in the ECMO circuit? Yeah. So it's a daunting looking machine, right? I had a med student once ask me it, why we couldn't send patients home on ECMO. And I was like, have you ever <laughs> seen an ECMO circuit? Listen, Not sometimes in works. the CICU, I wonder. But yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I, won't, I won't argue there. Um, so when I explain the circuit, I like to explain it sort of starting from the patient and then going around and then back to the patient so that you sort of have, you're traveling in, in that space. So starting from the patient, there's a venous cannula, which is like a large catheter. We're talking anywhere from like 14 French, let's say in a really small kid to 31 in a very large patient with the biggest kind of cannula we use. So it's pretty big. It's like a hose and it is either inserted into the internal jugular vein or the femoral vein generally for most purposes. The tip of that cannula is sitting at the SVC RA junction if you have an IJ cannula or it's sitting at the IVC RA junction if you have a femoral cannula. So pretty long cannula in there. And it drains the blood from the patient to the circuit. And then you go through some tubing and then you get to the membrane oxygenator or the also called the membrane lung or the lung. That's where oxygen and carbon dioxide are going to be exchanged down their concentration gradient. So the way this works is the initial membrane oxygenators were uh, made of silicone. And the way I think of them looking is they were sort of like a metal cylinder. And then inside that metal cylinder is a silicone roll of paper towels. But if you think of that roll of paper towels as having two ply, then between the two ply, the oxygen travels and around the two ply, the blood travels. And across it, or sort of between you know, the plies, the blood and the oxygen interface, and the CO2 diffuses out of the blood and into the, the sweep or the oxygen so that it diffuses down its concentration gradient and the oxygen diffuses into the bloodstream from the sweep. And so the oxygen is attached to the membrane on the top and it just kind of runs off leader flow from either a tank or the wall, just like oxygen would to a nasal cannula. And the flow, like I said, is, is the sweep, right? So it's, I think of it as sweeping away the carbon dioxide. So that's why I, how I remember that it's sweep or how I help people remember that it's sweep. And then the CO2 removal is actually pretty efficient because there's really no CO2 in oxygen, right? It's 100% oxygen going. So you're really efficient at removing CO2. 
still efficient, but not quite as efficient as giving oxygen to the system. The newer membranes we use are called, um, well, I won't use the brand name, but mostly are made of polymethylpentene hollow fibers. Say that three times fast. PMP is the easier way to say that. And these, um, I think of also dating myself, you know, the game that you may have had as a kid where there's like a bed of nails and you can imprint your hand on it. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Okay. Throwback. Yeah. yeah. So, so the PMP membrane looks just like that thing, <laughs> that game that probably has a name and I don't know it, um, except if you think of the nails as having lumens in them, right? So they're tubes instead of nails. So now you have a similar concept where the oxygen and CO2 can diffuse down their concentration gradient, but this time the oxygen goes through the lumen and the blood goes around the nails. And that's how it diffuses down the concentration gradient. And then the blood's going to come out the other side with CO2 removed and oxygen added to it. And we mostly use these hollow fiber membranes these days because they're less thrombogenic, they last longer, and they're less inflammatory than silicone membranes. So these are much, and they're much more efficient because they have a bigger surface area because there's all of those little lumens or, or hollow fibers. Then the blood goes to the pump. Old days, we used a roller pump, which I'm sure Alice and Zach have never seen because they're pretty much gone except in a couple of like steadfast cardiac ICUs mm -hmm. where they have little tiny babies. The roller pump was this big, huge metal device. And when this med student asked me about, you know, could we send them home on ACMO? This is the sort of device we were using. So I was like, I don't think mm. you understand what you're talking about here. Mm -hmm. um, so it's this big metal device and sitting on top of the device is a uh, sort of like a wheel with a track around it. And inside that track, the blood tubing runs and there are two big spokes on the wheel and they turn at an RPM that is sort of programmed in and they push the blood along the track by mechanical forces. And there's like a little handle that's taped up next to it in case the power goes out or you have to travel and you turn it by hand. Hmm. I make it sound like I did med school in like 1846, but I actually... It's like the, the butter churning, I feel <laughs> <Yeah>. like. <laughs> I actually graduated in 2004, so it's not yeah. that long ago that we were... Hang in there, Trevor. <laughs> that's right. The yeah. ECMO circuit. You're making mashed um, potatoes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, the, the reason that we got away from roller pumps, though, is that the process is pretty like hemolytic and mechanically destructive to blood cells because you're pushing that stuff along. But mm. the bigger reason, the more important reason is, imagine that there is a clot or an obstruction or someone steps on the tubing distal to the pump. If that happens, you have an obstruction distally. And because you're using mechanical forces to push that blood along, you get pressure buildup in the system between the pump and the obstruction. And you can actually get an explosion of the pump, which is never oh a good scene. Not good. We don't like that. No. So what they used to use in the olden days, um, back in the day, was they used something called a bladder and they would splice in this sort of distensible balloon into the tubing so that it could absorb the pressure differences. But that only worked to a point. So, I mean, you could still get like spin art blood spattered walls if it exploded, which again, like Nightmare. no one wants that. So now we use, no, yeah. And luckily you've also never seen that hopefully, right? Because now we use a centrifugal pump. And the centrifugal pump is what almost all programs are using these days, sometimes not for little babies for reasons that are probably beyond the scope of this conversation. But the blood comes to the pump from the membrane and there's the pump actually consists of just a little cylinder with a well a metal cylinder with a well. And in the well, there's an embedded magnet. And that's all set up to the processor and the computer and some sort of technology. And then sitting inside the well is your pump head, which is a disposable. So this is made of plastic, very expensive disposable, but it's disposable. And that it looks sort of like a saucer with a top inlet and a side outlet. And the blood comes in the top. And inside, there's a disc that has spokes on it. And the disc has a magnet embedded in it, and it hovers above the magnet in the pump. And you have your pump, you know, set at an RPM or revolutions per minute that you want the magnet to cause the other magnet to spin. And that disc spins at the RPM that you set, and it pushes the blood out the side of the pump head out of the... And so if there's a distal obstruction in this situation, 
the wheel just spins. It doesn't actually cause pressure to build up. So that allowed us to eliminate using the bladder in most cases, although some people are like really stuck to keeping the bladder in place. Most don't anymore. And it also allowed for it to be a little bit less dangerous to step away from the circuit for a second to maybe have someone managing two circuits simultaneously Mm -hmm. because it's unlikely that your circuit's going to suddenly explode if a clot forms or something like that. So those that's the pump. And then the blood sent back to the patient by either the arterial cannula, which is sitting either in the carotid artery or the femoral artery um, or the axillary artery or centrally through the chest into an artery. That would be a patient on VA ECMO or to a venous cannula. We call it an, I sometimes refer to it as the arterialized cannula because it's oxygenated blood now, but that blood can go to the venous return cannula which is either going to be in the IJ. If you have a dual lumen cannula, you're taking from the IJ and putting it back in the IJ. Less commonly, you might see it returned through the femoral vein. Most likely, they would return it through the IJ instead of the femoral, even if we're using two cannulas in this patient. So the main setups that we use are going to be for a patient who needs VV, you're usually going to see femoral IJ. So the blood comes out the femoral vein and goes through the circuit and then goes back into the IJ. That's the classic form of VV. Or you're going to see a dual lumen bicaval cannula. So that's going to be like a cannula that removes the blood from the SVC RA junction, from the IVC and the SVC, and then returns the blood back through the IJ, but in a different lumen that's aimed at the SVC RA junction so that it doesn't get sucked back into the cannula. Um, And then for VA, the most common for babies is going to be IJ carotid or transthoracic through the chest, which is central cannulation. Or for a bigger patient, when they just need hemodynamic support and not respiratory support, you might see femoral, femoral VA cannulation. The axillary artery is like a newer thing that you can use in a bigger patient instead of the carotid because it's not going to cause a risk of stroke. And then there's like some sampling ports and stuff, but like those aren't that important. So maybe when we're at the foot of the bed and we look over there at the circuit, it looks complicated because it kind of is. But <laughs> yeah. but our learners coming in, if they wanted to simplify it down so they just understand the basics, there's a venous or a drainage cannula. There's a membrane lung, which really is just functioning to increase surface area for it to allow gas exchange. There's a pump, and there's some variabilities in the pump, but there's a pump, something that gives pressure to the blood, and then it comes back to the patient, whether that's going to be in an artery or, or a great, ve- great vein. And really wherever that blood is being drawn from and then where it's being placed back is going to decide if you're VA or veno arterial or VV or veno venous. Correct. Exactly. Good job. I think this is really wonderful to kind of understand the the mechanics and, you know, what's actually going on. I think that's a great way to unveil what's literally under the black box. Um, We've talked a lot about VA and VV. And VV, I think, is something commonly when, again, we talked about respiratory failure going on. Can you talk about some of the common indications for someone needing an ECMO for VV and then also for VA and when VA might be considered rather than VV. Yeah. So a patient who needs VV is generally going to be a respiratory failure patient with ARDS, right? So that's from lots of different sources. They could have a pneumonia from a virus. More more recently, obviously, everybody knows that COVID was a common indication um, for adults certainly to go on ECMO, although we had some pediatric patients in in the pediatric world as well, certainly, that needed it. Um, There are patients that are going to need it for influenza, hopefully not too many this year because we're already pretty stretched in the pediatric world. And really, these patients are, like we said, high vent settings on like 80 to 100 percent oxygen on high peeps with OIs that are approaching or are above 40 despite optimal management. And you're sort of tracking their OI as you're getting blood gases. For a patient who's needing VA ECMO, more commonly, the the standard indications for VA are you know, not able to support them without significant lactic acidosis, et cetera, despite pressors. So those are patients with myocarditis, with congenital heart disease postoperatively, with septic shock who can be supported. You can, you can sometimes run into a problem with patients who have septic shock that because they're so vasodilated or vasoplegic is the word we use, you might not be able to get adequate flow in order to support them on VA ECMO, but we can certainly try. Toxic ingestion, so classically a calcium channel blocker ingestion is one where you might consider VA ECMO. Mm. Persistent arrhythmias, congenital diaphragmatic hernia, other respiratory failure that isn't amenable to VV ECMO. So for example, in a three kilo baby, there's not a lot of places to do VV ECMO. 
and we used to have a um, a special bicable cannula for infants that went off the market and has not really come back, despite people kind of keeping their fingers crossed that it would. And there are some newer versions of that that I haven't really personally used yet, so I can't speak to um, whether they're going to be a good replacement. But for the most part, babies under some places would say five kilos, some might say 10 or 15, will end up on VA even if they're going on for respiratory failure. And then if a patient is needing to go on in the midst of a cardiac arrest, then that's eCPR or extracorporeal CPR, essentially, right? And so those patients are always going to go on VA. That's really helpful. Yeah. Well, something that really was really was really unclear to me coming through residency, and even now as a fellow at times, is what makes a patient a great ECMO candidate, what might not make them a great ECMO candidate. And I know it's controversial, but yeah. <laughs> if you were to leave our listeners with some broad strokes, general guidelines, what what comes to mind? Yeah. I mean, no wonder you're confused, right? Because people have really strong opinions about this and that is a moving target. But as a general, like historically general rules, the people who will be the best ECMO candidates, the person that you think has like a 95% chance of recovery, is going to be someone who has a reversible condition that we know is reversible, has no other underlying major medical conditions, has either single failure, uh, organ failure or just their heart and lungs failed, um, has an intact immune system. Because you, remember, you have all of these artificial surfaces that the blood is being exposed to. So the risk of infection on ECMO is incredibly high. And it's also really hard to tell when someone's infected because they can't really mount a fever and their white count might be elevated anyway. And, you know, there's a lot of other things that we use to detect sepsis, you know, blood pressure, for example, that you don't really get when they're on ECMO. So that's another reason that the intact immune system is so important, that they have vessels that are available to cannulate and that they have an expected course of less than a few weeks. So that's not to say that if these indications aren't met, that you are absolutely can't go on ECMO, but the best candidates have meet all of those criteria. And if um, this is somebody who may need longer than a few weeks or something, it's not that they can't stay on. It's that generally the outcomes are a little bit less good the longer you're on, because remember, you have to be systemically anticoagulated. And so the risks of bleeding, of uh, other sort of complications and infection and things like that increase the longer you're on. And then it's generally limited in infants who are too small. So under about 1.8 kilos, you're really limited by size. Um, under 34 weeks gestational age, you're limited by the risk of intraventricular hemorrhage. So you can't put a patient on that's younger than 34 weeks, really. You know, so these are a little bit back and forth. There's also this sort of vague, uh, the ELSO guidelines sort of say low probability of good outcome and quality of life or something like that, which is like a throwaway, right? It's anybody you don't think is going to do well. Um, and we all, you know, it's a, it's a truly scarce resource in times of, for example, the pandemic. So we sometimes have to make difficult choices about who gets a circuit and who doesn't. And that's one of the few truly scarce resources in the, in the medical field these days. Mm -hmm. So um, it, can be, it can be a little bit hard to decide. And it doesn't fix anything, right? ECMO is only gives you a bridge to have more time. That's right. So it's bridge to recovery, bridge to decision. So a decision about whether to continue life supporting, life sustaining therapies, um, bridge to transplant in some situations, but it doesn't do anything positive for the patient other than allow them to rest their heart and or their lungs or both. And that's really the most important part. And this is where I get real frustrated when I see people trying to push a patient off ECMO. The whole point, especially on VV ECMO, is to rest the lungs. And if we push the lungs the second we go on ECMO to see how much we can get out of them, you won't recover. So you really have to sit at rest settings and you give yourself some time, give the patient some time to start to recover. And then you start testing very briefly to see whether they're getting any pulmonary compliance, whether you can inflate their lungs with a little bit of pressure. And if you can't, you back off and you wait some more. And then you try again in a few days or a week and if you can't, you back off and you wait some more. And people have different, you know, there's this sort of sit on your hands as the don't just do something doctor stand there sort of situation, right? So you don't want to be super aggressive because the harder you push to get a patient off, the less likely they are to come off. Well, bringing it back to the lung rest of our patients. So we've here, we've got this four-year-old just cannulated onto VV ECMO due to refractory hypoxemic respiratory failure. We're using the right IJ and the right femoral vein. What parameters are we setting on the ECMO pump and what are our general goals for blood flow, gas exchange, the numbers we're trying to hit, 
Yeah. So generally when you set your parameters, you're going to, so for a patient who's on VV like this patient, you are going to initially start going up on your RPMs until you stop getting like a lot of good flow increases. Mm -hmm. So like you start getting diminishing returns as you keep going up on your rate of spinning that disc, right? Because you're just kind of, you're not getting enough preload to the circuit to be able to eject. So you push your RPMs up a bit until you start getting diminishing returns and then you see where your SATs are at. And before you, you um, decide how much flow you're going to need over the long haul, you're probably going to want to decrease your ventilator settings to where we put them at rest settings. Mm. But, but we'll, we'll titrate up our flow until we get kind of where we're able to sit. And then we see where your SATs are. If your SAT is 100 with that, and especially if you start having trouble maintaining that flow, back off. You don't need a SAT of 100. Right. We um, one of Dr. Durgham's other great phrases that he used to always say is oxygen is overrated. I say, but oxygenation is not. So we want to oxygenate the patient's tissues, but you don't need your SAT to be 100 percent. Lots mm -hmm. of patients live without a SAT of 100. So the goal SATs in, in VV ECMO are going to be usually in the 80s because you're not going to be getting your entire cardiac output into the circuit. <clears throat> and this is actually where that extra PO2 times 0 0.003 starts to be important mm. because your ECMO membrane is going to insert a lot more oxygen into the bloodstream than your lungs do unless you're sitting on 100% oxygen. So the ECMO circuit can increase the PO2 in the blood outside that comes out of the membrane to three to 500 or more. And so when you have that much PO2, now when you multiply it by 0 0.003, it actually has like some oomph, right? It mm -hmm. like actually carries some potatoes. And so those potatoes that are swimming around free and not bound to any hemoglobin can go find hemoglobin to bind to in the circulation that's not getting oxygenated by the lungs. So in a VV patient where you might only be able to get your SAT to 75 without that extra PO2, you can get your SAT in the 80s, even if you're not getting the whole cardiac output in there. So that can be really helpful in those patients. So you're, you're going to increase your flow to that. And then your sweep, generally what people will do is they'll pick a sweep that is usually as many liters as your liter flow is. And that's a made up number that we just picked out of the air. And then you get a blood gas and you see what your CO2 is. And if your CO2 is too high, then you go up on your sweep. And if your CO2 is too low, you go down on your sweep. You just try to keep normal blood gases. Yeah. And talking about the normal blood gas, because I think this makes a lot of sense. You go up on oxygen if you need oxygenation. You go up on sweep if you need to come down on the CO2. Um, let's say that I am starting my PICU residency rotation. It's Tuesday. I'm the first day. I just took over patients. I have an ECMO patient. I'm on rounds. They look at me and they say, Justin... <laughs> take it away. <laughs> what are the what are the things that I'm reporting? How, you know, what are the settings? I get, someone brings me three different blood gases. <laughs> what am I looking at? How do I interpret them? How how am I uh doing the real goal of medicine, which is not looking silly on rounds? Yeah. I mean that is the main goal of medicine, not looking silly in general. Uh, right? Obviously, right. Um unless it's intentional. Um so there are it depends on who you're rounding with, right? Because some people feel very strongly about certain things. Fair enough. As yeah. does anything. <laughs> Absolutely. Depend on that, right? Um, but I think the main things that you're going to be reporting are initially going to be your flow, your sweep, your your RPMs in a centrifugal pump. And then you're going to start talking about your blood gases, like you just mentioned. So the blood gas that you'll probably report out first with that is basically what you're achieving, right? And what you're achieving is what you're getting from the patient. And so you want to report the patient's blood gas. So the patient has an arterial line, ideally in a VA ECMO patient specifically, you want it in the right radial artery, but you're going to report out that gas. And if you are achieving a blood gas of 7, 4, 40, 90, good job, you win for the day and you get to not get yelled at on rounds, right? Normal arterial blood gas, Normal that's the Normal arterial goal. blood gas. Yeah, usually. I mean, you might want to adjust the CO2 or the PO2 depending on the indication. Maybe there's concern for brain injury. You don't want the PO2 to be too high. Maybe there's concern Fair. for pulmonary vascular resistance. You don't want the CO, you know, you want to play around with some of the gases in there. But for the most part, you want to look for a relatively normal gas. The fellow can take care of that. Do I, pick you stuff, right? Just do yeah. pick you stuff. Yeah, it's <laughs> pick you stuff. Yeah. Um, and then there's two other gases that you're going to be measuring pretty frequently. So there's the pre-membrane gas or the venous gas, and there's the post-membrane gas. And they're for two different purposes. So the pre-membrane gas gives you my most favorite number, which we've talked about, which is 
the SVO2. The SVO2. Good job. See, you're going to know this stuff by the end. You're going to walk in tomorrow and be like, I will take ECMO patients in clinic. Piece of cake. <laughs> Um, piece, of, piece of cassava fruit. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Avoid the cassava fruit. So <laughs> French fries. Um, so the pre-membrane gas or the venous gas is to evaluate the adequacy of oxygen delivery and extraction. You may be looking to achieve a certain SVO2, especially in a patient on VA ECMO, because again, the SVO2 is really the thing that we're watching in a patient that has poor cardiac output and the lactate, obviously. The SVO2 goal in an ECMO patient is going to be at least above 60% because we like a little cushion before we get to that 50% number that makes us super nervous where you have to start eating cassava fruit, cassava root. Um, so you're going you're gonna to be looking at that SVO2 and you're going to then put that into your monitor, which is continuously monitoring your SVO2 with a little sensor on the tubing so that you can calibrate and make sure that your gases mm. are correlating. So that number you're going to report out and say we're achieving SVO2s of. And then the post-membrane gas, which you're usually just getting about two times a day, is really measuring the efficacy and the um, sort of the condition of your membrane lung. So as your membrane lung ages, it gets clot in all of the little corners and sometimes in other spots, depending on how good a job you're doing anticoagulating. And so you want to see that the the membrane uh, lung is still getting that PO2 to the 300 and to 500 range. So you really want it to be very effective and efficient. It may start to fall a bit. You'll want to check a couple of gases, but if it suddenly gets very low, um, then you may have to think about changing out the membrane. Mm. And they they have like a little pit crew and the specialists and everyone stands at the bedside and we time them with a timer and it's really dramatic. And they cut out the pieces and they attach new ones and they're back on pump in like 30 to 60 seconds, assuming that the pit crew is really fast. Um, but if you start to see that membrane aging, you'll start to see that post-membrane PO2 drop. So that's the number you're looking for in that post-membrane gas. You don't care about the other numbers in that gas. The venous gas, you're really looking at the SVO2 and maybe the lactate. You don't care about other numbers in that gas. The patient gas, you care about the same numbers you would normally in a patient gas. Beautiful. and. Just to clarify, when we're talking about the settings, like the oxygen flow, the sweep, and the RPM, two quick follow-up questions. Can you go over what though some of those typical numbers are? Is flow based on a percentage like it would be? What's a sweep number? Is it like four? Is it 7,000? <laughs> and um, is the RPM for both VV and VA, or is that more for the cardiac pressure that you're supporting? Yeah. So um, the sweep is going to be in liters per minute. It's literally an oxygen tube coming from the wall. So it's like, two liters is two liters of sweep. Mm. And if you were to take it off, it would literally be two liters of oxygen coming out of that tube. And it's just attached to the membrane lung. So that's in liters. The flow is also in liters. Usually if you're on a VA ECMO in a real little infant, that's going to be 100 to 150 milliliters per kilo per minute, or you know somewhere in the range of 500 to 700 mLs, 0.5 to 0.7 liters. In a bigger patient, you can go lower on that because they're not going to need as much flow because bigger patients don't have as big a as much needs as an infant. So um, it'll be like 80 milliliters per kilo, and that might be three, four, or five liters, depending on the size of the patient. In a VV patient, you're also going to have liters of flow, and I titrate those liters of flow to sats down to the amount that we need to sort of maintain the integrity of the circuit. You don't want to keep it going too slow because then you're increasing your risk of clot. So, you know, even if your patient's getting better, you don't drop your flow to like half a liter if you don't have to. You just adjust the sweep and the oxygen, the FDO2 or the fractional uh, oxygen delivered to the membrane in that case. You talked a lot about how the venous oxygen saturation can give you an idea how well and adequately you're delivering oxygen. We also have NEARS on these patients and, and maybe a, a full discussion of NEARS, maybe a bit beyond what we're doing today, but what is that essentially and how do you use it? Yeah. So, I mean, I'm not going to do it justice, but I'll try. So NEARS is like what I refer to as a poor man's SVO2, but only because I'm biased and I didn't have them growing up. Most would say it's actually probably a rich man's SVO2 because it's really, I mean, it's an expensive piece of machinery. It's a proxy for microcirculatory oxygen saturation. So it's really like you put a NEARS on the forehead, you put a NEARS on the flank, and you want to see essentially it's measuring like a venous saturation. So those numbers should sort of be reflective of what you'd see in an SVO2. The other nice purpose for them in ECMO is actually that when you have a patient who's cannulated uh, through an artery that is perhaps important for blood flow to a limb, let's say femoral artery or axillary artery, you can actually put a NEARS on that limb 
and make sure that they maintain adequate oxygen saturations in the adequate NIRS readings on that limb to make sure they're not getting ischemic. The other thing you could do is just put a reverse, like a little cannula in there to return some blood flow distal to the cannula, but both would also be ideal. Um, so we do use the NIRS in those patients. And the other situation where that might be helpful too is on VV ECMO, there's this special situation that you can run into where that SVO2 number might not actually be reliable. And that is a situation where you have recirculation. And recirculation is when the blood coming out of the, the, of the circuit to the patient gets sucked back up into the drainage cannula or drainage lumen. And you get <clears throat> overly oxygenated blood to the circuit and decreased oxygenation to the patient. And so what you start to see is a reversal of your venous saturation and your arterial saturation. So now your SVO2 was 65, but now it's 82 and your arterial saturation is 74. That's not ideal, right? Because you don't want, you're not trying to oxygenate the circuit, you're trying to oxygenate your patient. So in that situation, on a, in a patient on VV ECMO, you don't actually have totally accurate, like you can't really use the SVO2 as a full proxy. So in a patient who's on VV, whose SAT is like, hanging right at 80%, like right as marginal hibernation as you can get, and their SVO2 is not reliable, you're really going to have to depend on your lactate to tell you whether you're adequately oxygen delivering. That's one time the SVO2 doesn't do it, but the NIRS might. So I, I have to give it up to the NIRS for that. Yes, a reluctant acknowledgement. And that yes. is really, it does seem like so much of the game is can you get the flows? Can you safely get enough blood oxygenated to oxygenate your VV ECMO patients? And can you safely get enough blood moving for your VA ECMO patients, right? Correct. Yeah. And sometimes you're tolerating stuff you don't want to tolerate. And it, you sometimes have to like cover the saturation on the monitor so no one looks at it. Because undoubtedly, you'll be sitting there with a patient who sat's like 82 and everyone's like getting really anxious. And then you'll just see someone like walk over to the ventilator and start playing with the vent and going up on the FIO2. Yeah. Like, Stop! And then you're going to ruin the lungs. Yeah. 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 Tolerate the sat. Toxigen. We're doing fine. Yeah, tax it. Oh, I like that. I'm going to use that. Yeah. Now, the other thing that we need to be looking at on the circuit is the pressure monitors. What should we be worried about when we when we start to see those change? Yeah, so, you know, it's funny. Not um, They don't actually use pressure monitors so much in the adult uh, ECMO circuits. Oh, so this is kind of a little bit um, specific to pediatrics in some places. It depends. But you're going to monitor it in four different places. So you're going to monitor the inflow, which is the that when you're talking about inflow and outflow, you're talking about the ECMO circuit because we're not talking about the patient in this situation. ECMOlogists and ECMO specialists in particular really are like circuit centric. Mm -hmm. So the inflow to the pump and the outflow to the patient pressures. So let's say the inflow pressures are the pressures to the pump. And those are really telling you about your preload. <clears throat> so they're telling you if the circuit has enough volume in it to maintain what it's doing. If that number gets too negative, that means that the circuit is sucking blood away from the patient. And um, if that number gets really positive, that means that you're well, you're filled up enough. The danger zone comes in that situation when you get to, most would say less than negative 100, because that negative 100 is where you might see cavitation. And cavitation is when bubbles or air is pulled out of solution. Mm -hmm. And you then get air in your pump head. And that is another no-go, no bueno for the circuit. So you try not to entrain air, obviously, into the pump. So that's your inlet pressure or your inflow pressure. Then there's the outflow pressure, which is basically a measure of the afterload to the pump. So that's your patient's SVR, if there's a clot in the arterial cannula or the venous return cannula. When that number gets very positive, it means that that's very resistant to flow. The other situation where that can happen is if your cannula that was placed is too small and it's just not adequate to, to deliver the flow that you want it to deliver. And so if that number gets very, very high, you might need to either... Think about your cannula, think about a clot, or think about dropping your patient's SVR with a vasodilator, so nicardipine, mm -hmm. nitroprusside, something to decrease resistance to flow. And then the other pressure, and, and actually your inflow pressure can also be affected by the size of the cannula, to be fair. And then the other pressures you're going to measure are the inlet and outlet pressure of the membrane. And this is really just measuring what we call the delta or the pressure drop. Mm -hmm. The pressure drop is what change in pressure there is across the membrane. And that number increases as you get more clot in it. So that delta will go towards 100. When it gets about 100, that's about time to think about changing out your, your uh, membrane. Overall, the measurements, just like any other thing, just like CVP and, and NIRS, are really trends. So the absolute number is not so important for the most part, except for that mm -hmm. inlet inflow pressure. You don't want that to get below 
negative 100. Some will tolerate it to negative 150, but like you're, you're playing with fire right. a little bit at some point. So this is great. I mean, it sounds like these are a lot of those other things that we're, we're monitoring for our rounds presentation. And it's cool to hear that it sounds like there's almost two patients. One is the patient and one is the, the membrane. That's right. Of making sure that these these clots and things aren't breaking our, I don't know where ECMO is in the train station, but that's okay. But I, um, <laughs> I, I uh, one of my uh, questions I've been looking forward to ask, let's say I'm, I'm on rounds. I did a great job. I presented the gases like I knew what I was talking about. The sweep and the, the flow are doing well. The delta pressures demonstrate that the health, the membrane is healthy and going strong. And then the nurse pulls me aside later and says that there's some chatter. What is chatter? What 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 I do? What I mess up? Yeah, you didn't mess up anything. So um, that's Oof. chatter is one word. That people also use the word chugging sometimes. Some people will differentiate. So chatter might mean the visual evidence on the monitor of changes in flow, kind of going up and down with the digital out readout. Um, but more what the nurses are usually talking about is the visual uh, evidence of turbulent flow in the tubing. And you'll actually see that tubing like moving up and down or swinging back and forth. And that's usually, I say, it's it's one of two things. It's either inadequate volume to the circuit, inadequate preload, in which case you might be seeing those inflow pressures be too negative, right? So you need to give volume to the circuit in order to flow it more. Or more often, I find, it is the overly exuberant expectations of the care team, <laughs> right? So mm. we're asking for too much. We need to calm down a little bit. If this patient sat is 90% and they're on VV ECMO, back it off a little bit. We're okay with a little chatter. Yeah, because you don't want to have to do so much lung dialysis, right? Right. You don't have to hey. dialyze that <laughs> well, fluid off. It's, it's not entirely, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you, want to, you want to get the fluid. You don't want to give more fluid than, or blood than you have to. So right. ideally, if you get chatter and you have room to back off a little bit, you might back off. Mm -hmm. So overworking the circuit and not so much just a clear measure of the patient's volume status. Right. It's kind of both. It's, it's you're basically, it's, the circuit trying to get more flow, but not being able to achieve it. So either you're asking for too much flow or the cannula is too small, which is not usually the case because mm -hmm. we are pretty good about getting the right cannula in, or there's not enough volume or you need to to back off and stop asking for so much. So when I'm in the PICU taking care of these kids really, really sick and we're, we're worried about them going on to ECMO, it's almost like when they actually get on ECMO, I just take a sigh of relief because we because a lot of things change. Do you mind just telling our listeners outside of the ECMO circuit, how do you change your management really in broad strokes here? No reason to get into very much detail because just thinking about our learners coming in, what are the big changes that you'll do for a patient's physiology differently when they're on ECMO? Spoken like a true ECMO uh, pick you fellow, right? You're, you're like, thank God they're on ECMO. Everything's going to get so much less scary now. <laughs> No, I've never said I never said that in residence. <laughs> that is the exact words that say like, oh, thank God my night's going to be so much better because they're on ECMO now. There's a few things that are going to change pretty significantly. One of them is going to be that in general, because these patients need to be anticoagulated, especially little patients, the smaller they are, the more important that's going to probably be, is that you need to be really careful about things that we're doing that we would normally not think about. Placing a peripheral IV or an NG tube can be lethal, right? Because they can bleed out. Now, I always say on an ECMO patient, it's better for them to bleed in a place where they can actually let the blood out than it is to bleed into an enclosed space. So at least if you place an IV, you can like wrap it and pack it and all sorts of other stuff or hold your anticoagulation for a minute. So bleeding is kind of one of the primary things you worry about. For a patient who is newly on ECMO, you are going to initially have them relatively sedated until you get them stabilized enough. And then depending on your program and the comfort level of the people at the bedside, mm -hmm. your goal is going to be to let them be as awake as they'll tolerate and as awake as, awake as you can support them so that you can allow them to rehab. There are patients that walk around, that sit up and eat, that do bicycles. I think I saw uh, Meg Scheffler was on one of your episodes and I, yeah! she, is, she is a friend of mine and she, I don't know if she remembers me, maybe we were certainly friends. She told me about a patient that they had at Hasbro where they were, they had a little tricycle that the kid was riding around oh the ICU on ECMO. So you want to mobilize them as much as you can, but you have to be careful, obviously, because you know, you've got that big hose draining all their blood all the time and then returning it. And then for a respiratory failure patient, you're going to put them on rest settings on the ventilator. So that's going to look like kind of a peep of 10, inspiratory pressure of 10, a rate of 10 or 15, and a long inspiratory time, and as little FiO2 as you can tolerate, as the patient can tolerate, 40% or less generally. And you may see no lung volumes. So you might see on your chest x-ray a totally whited out chest x-ray. And um, I once got a chest x-ray read after we cannulated a patient for ECMO, 
the radiologist actually called me and said, I just wanted to talk to you because this is the worst ARDS I have ever seen. And I said, wow. yes, yes, thank you. I, um, I know that's the diagnosis I would give him too. And he said, and also mm -hmm. there's a very large catheter sitting with its tip <laughs> in the IVC. Is that intentional? <laughs> I said, yes, you've That's identified perfect. the ECMO cannula and the reason that we can see this patient's lungs uh, despite that. But what you don't see there is any air spaces. And you can expect to not see any air spaces for some period of time. And I usually tell the residents and fellows not to try to be recruiting or aggressive at all with the lungs until they start seeing air bronchograms. And I describe it as, do you guys know the book A Tree Grows in Brooklyn? Yeah. 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 yeah with okay. the outcrawl. Yeah. 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 Okay. So there's a little girl who was like raised in the tenements at the turn of the century, and she thrives despite being in a very difficult and very trying environment. I think of the air bronchograms as a tree growing in Brooklyn. The little buds start coming out. You start seeing little branches, and then you see another branch, and then you see another branch, and then you start to see little leaves at the end. Those are your alveolar sacs, and you start to literally see it grow over a few days. And once you start to see those trees growing, that's when you start to know that the patient might be starting to get better, might be recruitable. You might be able to start to um, work on their lungs a little bit. And then the other thing you might do in that patient is bronch them to see if you can clear out their lungs a little bit. I really appreciate that and needed to hear it early and now, because in my mind, it's very hard to just sit and wait for the lungs to recover. And so giving, giving a little something to look for every morning at x-ray rounds, like you see that oh. air bronchogram new from yesterday yes. is, is I think, very positive. That's positive, right? And, and as those branches branch other branches, you get excited and you start to say like, well, maybe I'll try a little, little bagging at a pressure of 30 today and just see what they do. And then you see if they develop tidal volume or get an end tidal waveform. And so, and so you're going to not see any end titles in these patients who are on VV. In a patient on VA, you are not necessarily going to do rest settings, right? You want to maintain the pulmonary vascular resistance at the mm -hmm. prime. You guys did West Zones in med school. Oh, yeah. Don't make me remind, oh, like, yeah. don't try to, I can't teach that effectively, but you want to maintain the best, lowest PVR that you can in a patient who's got cardiac failure, of course. And so you're going to try and keep those patients appropriately recruited, not over-recruited, not under-recruited. Mm -hmm. So those patients are not necessarily going to be on rest settings, but your VV patients are going to be on rest settings. Nice. And that makes sense because also the tricycle patient is going to clearly be on VA. Is that safe to say like the VV? The Either one. You you might be extubated doing okay and still be on ECMO. Sure. Yeah. All and, right. Well, let, let, let's turn over to Alice's question because yeah. I think that might get to it actually. Yeah. Well, we were going to pivot to really the process of starting to wean your flows, wean your FiO2 and how you know when someone is ready to be liberated from ECMO. Yeah, so let's separate the two types because I don't want to, I feel like I've been a little bit confusing, not like differentiating each time. But yeah, so if you have a patient, I and I think VV is like way more interesting and way more complex in some ways, but let's, so let's start with VA because <laughs> VA is basically heart lung bypass, right? And so if you have a patient on VA ECMO, things that you will see that are uh, signs of recovery are going to be increasing pulsatility, which means the arterial waveform on their art line is going to start to be bumpy again when previously you might have had a blood pressure of 80 over 72, right? Now, you need to maintain some pulsatility, some bumpiness in order to eject from the left heart while the patient's on VA ECMO. Otherwise, that pressure and that blood that goes through the lungs and gets to the heart builds up and dilates that LV, and then they can get back pressure on their lungs and have a pulmonary hemorrhage. So you need some pulsatility. I, ideally, you need a difference of at least like 10 between your systolic and your diastolic blood pressure throughout the ECMO run to maintain adequate ejection. But let's say that you had just 10. Now you're going to start to see that your pulse pressure gets to 20 and 30, and you're not needing any vasoactive agents to maintain that. And you start seeing it actually cardiac squeeze on echo. You start seeing the patient tolerate movement and wakefulness. You start seeing their lactate stay nice and normal and their SVO2 not dip every time they move around. Um, and you start seeing the ability to wean your flows without a significant change in your hemodynamics and your lactate. Now, you don't want to wean your flows all the way off or super low because, again, you don't want to clot your circuit. But you can wean them pretty low, at least for some period of time, to check and see if they can support themselves. And so in VA ECMO, you'll wean them as low as you feel is safe for your circuit for a little while. And then you'll probably go back up to maintain the circuit. And then when you're really ready to trial a patient, you'll do what's called a clamp trial. 
And this is where you get all of your stuff ready just in case. You get epi spritzers, or some people call them dwindle epi. You get your bicarb, you get your calcium, you get all the things ready, and you put your epinephrine in line, and you slowly wean down the flows until you're off, and you clamp, and you let the patient go, and you see what they do. You usually keep them relatively sedated for this so that they don't have to do extra metabolism from being awake. And you see if they can tolerate it with minimal vasoactive support, minimal epinephrine and such things. And see that their lactate's okay, make sure that their SVO2 is okay. And you can do this for half an hour to an hour. You really don't want to clamp for much longer than that. And then you'll go back on and decide, did they tolerate that trial? Are they ready to come off? And um, if so, then that's when you come off circuit. For a VV patient, it's actually a little easier to trial them because you don't have to clamp the circuit in VV. If your patient has evidence of tidal volumes, chest rise, is able to get a tidal volume that's, you know, four to six per kilo on what are either rest settings or lower. I actually like for them to do this on extubatable settings. I definitely get some flack mm. for that because that's like people like to get off as soon as they possibly can. But, you know, I, I went through the, pro- the pain and process of getting the patient on ECMO. I don't want to take them off until I know they're better. So you can get them to extubatable settings. You want to see that you have a good tidal volume, that your end tidal CO2 is similar to your PCO2 on a gas which means that you're exhaling the same amount of CO2 that you are seeing in your blood gas, and that means the circuit's not doing as much. You want to see that your sweep is coming down, that the patient's tolerating being awake with the sweep down. They can tolerate physical therapy if they're old enough to be awake and and doing that while on circuit with their sweep down or off. And then, um, and then you want to see that they're not needing more than, I usually say, 50% FiO2. And then you're going to, instead of necessarily, depending on whether their issue is more oxygenation or ventilation, you're going to either wean your sweep way down or just disconnect it from your circuit, or you're going to wean your FiO2 or FDO2, your delivered oxygen to Mm -hmm. the circuit, down to closer to room air. And you can hang out with no sweep on for 24 hours if you want to really prove to yourself, make sure they do a, you know, I I had a, a COVID patient where I made sure that they could do physical therapy, off sweep, and tolerate it without having significant downtrends in their respiratory status. And they did. And so they were ready to come off. So that's kind of how you know. It's a good answer. It's it's almost impossible to answer that in a succinct way because you have to be at the bedside. You have to look at the patient. You have to know Mm -hmm. how sick they were when they went on to ECMO and what their trajectory is currently and where they headed moving forward. Yeah. And if you're not having complications, um, especially in a patient who's on VV ECMO, where the risk is lower than being on an arterial, having, you know, an arterial blood flow uh, cannula, you know, the better part of Valor is to sit tight for a little while if you're not sure, because it's a good support in the meantime. And so I tend to be a little bit later to come off, especially on a VV patient, because um, I'd rather really get them better first as much as I can. Now, if they're having complications, if they're bleeding, if there are other issues, or if we realize that they don't have a reversible illness, or they're not a transplant candidate and their illness isn't reversible, that's a different conversation. So for our learners, they come into the PICU, they see this patient sedated, paralyzed, two big cannulas coming out of their neck, It looks really morbid. It looks like this patient might not make it. But what outcomes should our learners expect for patients on ECMO? And maybe is there a certain patient populations that do better, maybe some that do worse? Yeah. What are your thoughts? Yeah. So there's lots of patients that do really well. Um, And I mean, that like more than the vast majority get off ECMO and do fine. Um, There's a great photo of Dr. Bartlett putting the white coat on a first year med student uh, at Michigan who he had put on ECMO as a baby. Um, Wow. Yeah, I know. It's a good one. Um, And uh, I would say the vast majority of neonates who go on for persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn or meconium aspiration syndrome or neonatal sepsis, they almost always do well and come off relatively quickly. Now with the advent of nitric oxide and and oscillators, we tend in better, you know, surfactant and better ventilation methods. A lot of those babies don't have to go on anymore. But um, the first patient he ever put on was a meconium aspiration with PPHN who now comes to the ELSO meeting every year and has kids of her own. Um, but those patients do really well. The patients who don't fit the criteria we talked about, though, are the patients who do less well. So um, 
you know, there is a lot of controversy about whether we put on patients that are very high risk. Um, oncology patients are kind of the hot topic right now. And, you know, when you talk to an oncologist, like they're sort of used to dealing in like really low numbers, right? Like they're like, they're used to dealing with patients that have a 10% chance of survival and they don't go like, well, we're not going to do anything. <laughs> they they still want to move forward with that. So it's hard to tell an oncologist, like this patient only has a 30% chance of survival, so we shouldn't go on ECMO, right? Like that doesn't make a lot of sense in some ways. But even in the oncology population are patients who will do better than other patients. So the patients that do the least well are the ones who have a long time until their immune system is going to become intact, who still have active disease, who are going on for unclear reasons or for a viral infection mm-hmm. that they're probably not going to clear. Those patients do less well in terms of like if you're looking at the whole population of ACMO patients. This has been great. You know, I think we've really covered you know, the indications for ECMO, for VV ECMO with respiratory failure, with VA ECMO for cardiac or other profusion difficulties. We've talked about how we're monitoring this, how we can look smart on rounds when we're talking about sweep and flow and the gases and monitoring the second patient, which is the big box in the room. We've talked about the outcomes and kind of how we're transferring people off ECMO and they often do quite well. With all these kind of big topics, do you have specific take-home points or what do you think the main points should be, whether it's a a medical student who's thinking about at-home ECMO, a resident who's doing their first day in the PICU, or a fellow who's teaching this and pursuing this? What are some of your main take-home points for our listeners? Yeah, I mean, I think um, it feels daunting, but ECMO is really about, like I said earlier, about oxygen delivery. And if you understand the need for oxygen delivery and how it works then ECMO is actually relatively simple to understand in some ways. Um, But also that ECMO is very resource and personnel intense therapy that you really need to be thoughtful and thorough about deciding when and how to apply it. Because it has, you know, not only is it resource and personnel intense, but it also has complications and has lots of things that can go wrong as well as things that can go right. And so as far as therapies we provide go, I think I really think it's our job to be stewards of this particular therapy and to help families. I sort of make a plug here for like my other role, which is palliative care, that while people sometimes think that ECMO and palliative care are weird interests and disparate interests to have, I actually think that they're really on a continuum. And if you're going to put someone on ECMO, you have to be thinking about what happens if this doesn't work or if we have a really big complication and is it worth the risk of the complications, but also is, you know, what happens next if we can't get better. And so I think keeping that in mind all the time and keeping in mind with the present state of the world, what sort of need there is, I think those are really important points for all of us to be thinking about. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for talking with us today. Before you go, is there anything else that you'd like to plug in terms of resources, um, things listeners should check out? Uh, Vaccines. Get vaccinated <laughs> against everything. Please, God, get flu vaccinated. Shot, flu shot, team. Flu yeah. shot, COVID shot, boosters, Penticel, all the things. Please, please. A little general, general pediatric tidbit <laughs> into this ECMO episode. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For the primary care providers out there. Nice. Yeah, Stay off to throw ECMO. them a bone. In yeah. This. Yeah. yeah. Help me help me not have to help you is what I usually tell people. Yeah. This is excellent. I think this has been a, a fantastic episode that's going to benefit a lot of learners. I, uh, this was a great throwback to my experience in the PICU, which uh, was uh, a bit traumatizing, but I think had I had this episode going in, I would have been ready to to just uh, sweep away all the negative. Huh. Um, that was for us. That, that was, was too good. much. That was too much. But we, have, we are very great. <laughs> all small potatoes. That was, that was the better fun. Um, <laughs> Karen, we appreciate you coming on. We appreciate you sharing your time and your expertise. Um, thank you so much for, for coming on this episode with us. We really, really appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. This has been another episode of the Cribsiders. It's for the kids. And Pete's Crit. It's for the sick kids. Get your show notes and sign up for our weekly Knowledge Food Formula Feeds newsletter at our website, www.thecribsiders.com or www.pedscrit.com. We're committed to providing you with high value practice change and knowledge. And to do that, we need your feedback. So please subscribe, rate, and review both shows on Apple Podcasts or any of your favorite podcast players. 
You can also contact us at the Cribsiders at gmail.com or PedsCritPodcast at gmail.com. We'd love to get a letter from you, especially if you like episodes like this and this type of collaboration. A special thanks to our producer for this episode, Dr. Sam Mazur, our executive producer, our showrunner, Dr. Sam Mazur, and our wonderful social media team on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. I've been Justin Lee Burke. I've been Alice. And I've been Zach Hodges. Thank you and good night. Hey, you've already listened to the entire episode. Now claim CME credit. Continuing education credit is provided by VCU Healthcare Continuing Education. VCU is accredited to provide continuing education to the entire healthcare team. Check it out at cribsiders.vcuhealth.org for more information and to claim your credit after listening to this episode.